Hey, it's Addo. Even though we're all eagerly anticipating the progress and eventual release of Update 2.2, which we know from Rob's teasers alone will revolutionize creating as we know it, I wanted to make a very quick and brief video for anyone who is new to building in GD right now, just to get you acclimated with the editor as a tool and some of the essentials you can do with it. I'd like to call attention to the fact that Samifying has an entire series of videos based on editor utility that you can find in the description for those of you who are interested in taking a deeper dive. But for now, I'll try to introduce you to as much as I can and hopefully waste as little of your time as possible in doing so. My Discord server is linked in the description if you have any questions about anything you're about to see and would like to reach out to me about it. For some quick terminology and lingo, most people break their judgmental levels into two equally important components, gameplay and decoration. Gameplay is what the level feels like to play, and decoration is any purely visual aspect of the level. Layouting is a term coined by the community that describes making a shell or a skeleton of a level in order to focus exclusively on the gameplay, such that the decoration can be filled in later. They can be made with any solid object, but I recommend these ones that look like outlines so that you don't have to delete anything. For beginners, I highly recommend making a layout of your gameplay before decorating it, even if you only make a few seconds of gameplay at a time. This game gives you the option to make any object invisible. Please make all objects that change a player's movement in any way visible. This rule can be broken, but it has to be broken so tastefully that it should be avoided if you have limited experience with the editor. For the sake of including them, since these are hard to figure out on your own, H-blocks allow you to hit your head on solid surfaces as a cube or a robot without dying, D-blocks allow you to collide with solid surfaces as a wave, S-blocks force cancel the dash orb effect, and J-orbs make it so that, say, if you hit a blue orb and you land on a platform immediately after, you won't jump off the surface automatically if you continue holding. It sounds oddly specific, but yes, that was a problem. D stands for... DART? For a brief period of time, the wave was called the dart, but the community had already committed to the name wave as soon as the 1.9 sneak peek came out, so after enough complaining, Rob finally changed it back to wave, but d-blocks are still d-blocks for some reason. If you hit the pause button and go to the settings menu, you can change how many rows and columns of buttons show up on your pages in the bottom center of the editor. You can configure this to your liking. I also recommend turning off effect lines, turning on duration lines, and turning on swipe cycle mode. Turning on the swipe function in the bottom right of the editor allows you to select multiple objects at one time, either by tapping on them individually or by dragging a selection box across them. It also lets you place and delete multiple objects by holding and dragging. If you have swipe cycle mode on, when more than one object is overlapping in the same place, clicking in the exact same place multiple times with swipe mode on will cycle between the overlapping objects as if you had swipe mode off. For the sake of including them, free move lets you drag stuff around, and snap puts it back on the grid when you're done. Familiarize yourself with the edit object and edit group buttons on the right, because half the battle of creating is in these two buttons alone. Your object customization tools have two main categories, color channels and groups. Edit object deals with color channels. Edit group deals with groups, as you might expect. You have approximately 999 color channels. Few people have ever needed to use all of them, but you can use the edit object button to assign a color channel to an object. When you open a color channel, you can use the color wheel to get the exact color that you want, and the opacity slider lets you tinker with its visibility. If the wheel isn't your cup of tea, selecting an object and hitting the RGB circles button will open up some gradated columns where you can customize the hue, saturation, and opacity separately. All of these changes will apply directly to the color channel assigned to the object selected and cannot be undone. Speaking of hue and saturation, the edit object menu has an HSV modifier, which stands for hue, saturation, and value, and you can find it in the top left corner, and that lets you change color on an object specific basis rather than making changes to the entire color channel. This is great for making gray with objects. Toggling copy color mode on the color channel will make that color channel mock the color of a different channel. And you also get an HSV menu here to specify if you want it to be a brighter copy, a more saturated copy, and so on. Copy channels also still have their own independent opacity and blending properties. Blending is a property that makes overlapping colors add their hue, saturation, and value together. It operates on the same logic that all of the colors of light make white light when combined. The background color is included in this combination, which is why all of your colors have to be in agreement to pull this off effectively. Adding opaque, non-blending black blocks behind the blending blocks prevents background interference. Black with blending is actually invisible because it's adding zero to the colors it's overlapping with. When blending isn't toggled, objects simply cover one another instead of combining their properties of light. The order that objects cover one another is also fully customizable, and that's where this edit group button comes in. In the top right, and in the row of buttons towards the bottom, you 
you can customize an object's Z layer. Z corresponds to front to back depth in the same way that X corresponds to horizontal position and Y to vertical. Objects with a higher Z layer will appear closer to the front. You should start with these B and T buttons, where B stands for bottom or back, and T stands for top. Imagine this like a spectrum. The farther you are to the left on this row, the farther behind the player you are. The farther right you are on this row, the farther in front of the player you are. The player exists on its very own true zero layer between B and T. Everything in B layers, the player covers. Everything in T layers covers the player. This number on the top right is the same way, except it only applies to the specific B or T layer selected. Setting this to 6 on B3 will be in front of all objects 5 and below on B3, and it will be in front of everything on B4, but behind everything on B2 and beyond. This is essentially a depth organizer with 7 sections. This big thing in the middle that we've been ignoring has to do with groups. A group is an identity. It's a name that multiple objects can call themselves, and when you address that group by name, all of the objects in that group respond. And how do you address a group by name, you ask? Tri triggers are instigators of change. You can find all of them in this tab here, and all of them serve different purposes. This one with the RGB circles permanently changes a color channel. The yellow pulse trigger temporarily changes a color channel. All of the rest of them pertain to groups. The move trigger will move every object in the group you tell it to move in the exact way you tell it to move. On these horizontal and vertical displacement sliders, 10 units represents one grid space. You can rotate one group around another group acting as a center, making sure that your center group only has one object in it or the game won't know which center to pick and the objects will all individually rotate around their own centers instead. The really tricky part is that you can use triggers to trigger other triggers. When the player's horizontal position equals the trigger's horizontal position, typically the trigger activates. But you can set any trigger to be touch triggered or spawn triggered. Touch triggering gives the trigger a hitbox visible in the editor that the player has to actually physically touch to activate the trigger. Spawn triggering makes a trigger only activate if a spawn trigger or a trigger similar in nature to a spawn trigger tells it to activate. You can use triggers to make objects do some dynamic things, but it can get tedious because making another iteration of the same effect in a different place requires it to use all new groups. Luckily, if you go to the pause menu and hit build helper, it will automatically reassign triggers and objects to groups that haven't been used yet out of everything in your current selection. Samifying's tutorials go more into depth on other helpful tricks, like the select filter or the rotate snap button, but this video should help you understand enough about the editor for you to start executing your ideas in level design and to find value in exploring the editor further.